the regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Directors for Sacramento Metropolitan Fire District for Thursday, March 14th to order. At this point, uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Yes, Director Sailors is absent this evening. Director Weber? Present. Director Sheets? Present. President Gould? Present. Director Wood? Present. Director Rice? Present. Director Jones is absent this evening. Director Costa is absent this evening. And Director Clark? Present. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, speaking of Director Clark, if you'll please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, sir. So well. Lots of Metro Cable announcements. If you're interested in those details, please look at the posted agenda for the details on how to connect and watch that ever popular and, and growing in viewership uh, every week. With that, I'd like to go ahead and uh, open the meeting to public opportunity to discuss matters of public interest within the district's jurisdiction, including items on or not on the agenda. Madam Clerk, do we have any speaker forms? We do not have any speaker forms. Arthur, uh, how about those online? Uh, online attendees, if anybody would like to pre present to the board, please raise your hand and I'll give you the opportunity to speak. No response. Sure wish there'd be a response every once in a while. All right, with that, let's move on to consent items. I'll entertain a motion for the consent. Mr. Chair, I'll move the consent. We have a first. I'll second. And we have a second. Any questions about consent from my colleagues? Hearing none, seeing none, let's go ahead and call the roll, please. Director Weber. Aye. Director Sheets. President Gould. Aye. Director Wood. Aye. Director Rice. Aye. Director Clark. Thank you, motion passes. Thank you very much, ma'am. Um, I'd just like to make everyone aware of the fact that we do have several items in closed session, so we will be semi-effective this evening to get through this as quickly as we can. We want to make sure that we spend ample time on presentation and action items. I'm not asking for you to reduce those presentations, but we will have a significant amount of work to do after we ask you all to go home. So with that, we'll move on to our presentation items. Chief Renicki, it looks like you're in charge of this particular item. Thanks for being here this evening. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Operate this thing. President Gould, directors, Chief House, colleagues, uh, John Rennicki, Assistant Chief Director of EMS. And tonight I wanted to bring to you uh, an update on our contract and partnership with AMR. As you're probably familiar, we, they are a partner of ours in the region and help us provide service delivery with ambulances. So tonight what I want to talk about is just the objective of our overall service delivery with our ambulances. Chief, sorry, just interrupt. Can you move the microphone close to your mouth, please? Sure, no problem. Thank you, sir. Not loud enough. All right. Very good. Is that good? All right. Sounds good. So tonight I just want to talk about the objective of our service delivery, which includes AMR, um, a little bit about the contract, our ambulance coverage across the district, our operational use, some consolidation efforts we make, and then what we're planning next and what we're anticipating. Um, if, you, if you don't mind taking a look at that picture, uh, to me that picture um, has a lot of symbolism and importance, and that's Station 41, and that's where I grew up on that ambulance. And so I have a lot of fond memories of that place. And so when I think about service delivery, I really think about all the many calls that I was privileged to be part of out of that station, and specifically that ambulance and, and, um, and that whole area. So that's why that's there. So. And the gym boy smell that is across the street? That was just a bonus. Okay. <laughs> So some of you may have been there when I delivered to the county on the um, APOT summit. And the message I shared there is one I want to echo here is our coverage and our service delivery is not strictly focused on the current patient we're on, the one in the back of the ambulance, the one we're with on the wall at the hospital. It's really about the next patient. And that's where the work with AMR and the coverage that we provide to the county is focused on. And that's why we're putting so much effort into addressing the APOD issue, 
to ensure that we have availability across the county to make sure we can respond in a timely manner. I assure you those are not real people. Those are AI-generated pictures, oh. so there's no HIPAA issues or anything like that. <laughs> but that is really where the focus is, is when we look at the coverage that we have across the district, it's about being positioned, and as we saw a lot of the data on our standards of coverage, it's about are we in the right spot, are we available, can we get there in a timely manner to save lives. So a little bit about our AMR contract. So it's a, initially it was a three-year contract with two one-year extensions, and so we, are, we completed the three and we are in the first extension right now. Um, last year, uh, July 1st of 22, we added two additional units. So today we operate 10 AMR ambulances and they assist us with district coverage. But another part of that plan when we added to was considerations for consolidation and more coverage across the district. As you're all familiar, um, the wall time issue has been affecting us and there's multiple days regularly where we're calling for our partners for surge coverage. And it became so regular that uh, we recognize there's a need for additional units. So that's where we're at now. We, this contract started with six, and you can see we've added two, and now we're at another two. Um, coming up in uh, July 1 of 2024, we'll have that opportunity to exercise that uh, last year of this contract. So our ambulance coverage. We have 20 ambulances that are 24 hours, our Metro Fire, and that's a combination of 13 fire medics and um, seven MMPs as of today. In addition, we have the 10, 12 hours ambulances um, covered by AMR. Another part of that uh, contract and partnership with AMR is the surge capacity. So when we hit drawdown and we're out, we call them and they give us additional units that they're able to, usually one or two. Um, layered on that, another surge is as you're aware, we have multiple surge contracts with other providers but our first call is, is with AMR. There's a map of our, our coverage, as again, you've seen in our standard of coverage, and I'm sure you've seen the map plenty of times. We really pay attention to the data and look at how many calls they're running, and so when we look at the placement of the AMR units, um, the nice thing with, with their location is we found wherever we're moving them, they're picking up calls. They're all equally busy, as all of our units are. With that, the strategy of having these day cars, there's an ability to move them around based on those needs and it's very flexible. As we've talked about with stations and the, the need or desire sometimes to move apparatus, you need space in those stations, you need bedding, you need uh, a bay for them, all those types of things. With these units, there's a lot of flexibility so we can put them in the right spot um, month to month or day to day as needed. So operational use. So again, the 10 units, we do use one of them at night hours, so night of them are during the day. So in addition to running the calls, um, they also do consolidation, and then the surge, uh, another component I spoke about earlier. So in the first six months of this fiscal year, so from July 1st through the end of December, we had a total of 351 surge hours. So these are, these are times when we're in drawdown and we need additional help so we can make sure we can get to that next patient. So those are the hours that they've given us at this point for um, when we need them and have assisted us in the system. Consolidation is a, is a process that we've done over the years, but when we added the two units in July, we formalized it with AMR's assistance, so it's a partnership. So tonight, um, we have Rebecca from AMR, and we also have Captain Jewel, who's EMS 24. So the way a consolidation works in the field is when we see there's drawdown, um, a hospital's impacted, uh, our supervisors in the field will contact the hospitals, find out what the plan looks like, how long they'll likely be impacted. And our field supervisor, EMS 24, and Rebecca, whoever's in her seat at AMR, they consolidate and communicate, and they'll meet up at MSJ, come up with a consolidation plan and make sure that we're able to take the four, five, or six separate units and combine them into one. Excuse me. 
in a safe manner, of course. It's all patient appropriate, what's gonna work, how we can manage that in a safe, safe way. But the benefit, as you can imagine, is we then yield four or five or six more ambulances back in the field to provide service to that next patient. It's been successful. We trialed it at Mercy San Juan initially and only kept it at that hospital because of the logistical needs to include um, gurneys and monitors and such. It's been wildly successful. So when we also designed it, um, we approached it as a pilot program where we, we had some parameters that in retrospect limited our ability to activate. Um, so what we've done in response to that is we've lowered and reduced that barrier. So the activation can be much quicker. We don't have to wait to react. We can be proactive to initiate much easier now. When we look at those past six months, the consolidation occurred 61 times. So 61 patients <clears throat> remained on the wall. They just had one AMR unit, so two personnel supervising them or watching them along with others. After that consolidation, what we found the average time that AMR still stayed on the wall on average for those 61 patients was an hour and 20 minutes or so. So they're still there with them. So overall to our members, um, our ambulances, the priority again objective is to get back in the field to provide service to the next patient that needs it, the next family. But also for them to rest and recover and recuperate and have that ability and that flexibility. So overall, we saved 80 hours for our members alone in those six months. Again, that was a success. That's what we were going for. I'm confident with if the demand of APOD continues, if the drawdown continues in the county regularly, I'm confident those numbers will increase because we've, again, reduced the barrier to activate and we can do it quicker. The other thing we change is we can now do it at all the hospitals. There's still a logistical component to it. However, we're now, wherever there's a need in the county, we're gonna respond and we're consolidating metro units with the help and the partnership of AMR. So that's how that process works. So what's next? Well, I just touched on it. It's that ability to do it more. It's the ability to go to whatever hospital's impacted, whatever the reason is for the day. We don't control their world, but we can be proactive in ensuring our members um, are utilizing the protocols to their advantage to take care of the patients best, but we can also consolidate more. Um, so that's, that's our plan, the enhanced, excuse me, the enhanced activation. Beyond that, there's, we also have contingency plans built as if the demand increases more, we have more steps we can take to make it even more effective and more aggressive. So a little bit in that crawl, walk, run coming out of that pilot program, I'm confident that with these units available to us, we're able to make a difference and be available for that next patient. So pretty short and sweet, do you have any questions? Piers, any questions for Chief Renicki? Go ahead, Brian. Chief, just real quick, I know over the years we've always had a very good public-private partnership with AMR, and um, I'll just, I'll make an assumption that that is still continuing. Correct. Good. Is that it, Brian? Yep. Any other questions for Chief or Nikki? Well, you can imagine I'll have a few. Don't go oh. anywhere. Oh, okay. <laughs> I should have known. All right, uh, first, thanks for the presentation. I love those short and sweet and to the point. Uh, this consolidation issue is creative. I'm glad to see it. I'd love for us to really educate the community on when EMS no longer receives reimbursement for that patient. I don't think our community understands the negative impact that APOD is having on our organizations, both our, our private partners and our own. And people, I think, sometimes sometimes don't understand that when we breach the door of a facility, we're not continuing to bill for services even though we're providing them. And I think that's a really critical thing. We don't sit around the hospital with the clock running and, and the shishing just going, right? That we have a limited ability to recoup. And so this is having not only a response impact, but it's having a significant economic impact on our organization as we're providing labor to another organization that gets to bill for the time that that person's there. That's the first thing. I'm, I'm, I'm glad that we're being creative. I would like us to consider down the road. Um, I love this consolidation piece. It obviously shows the brilliancy of the group. Um, 
I'm concerned that we don't have surge protection that includes restoration time. And maybe that's what consolidation does. But when we have medic units that are over the top in unit hour utilizations and our men and women are running calls that far and exceed anything that's a standard that maintains the mental health and the physical well-being of our men and women, there needs to be an opportunity to bring on additional resources simply for restoration purposes, not for running that next call. Because when you're on the backside of a 48 and you've run 35 patients, your men and women are just tired and worn out. And if, they, if they're staying on duty, there needs to be an opportunity. We have examples of organizations taking restoration breaks and that impacting the system. I think it's time for Metro to look at how do we do something that's completely vetted. You all think about when that trigger happens, but I think we've got to look at when we hit a certain benchmark of our men and women that work for us, we have to have surge protection consolidation that directly allows those men and women to restore themselves in order to maintain that high quality patient care that we're known for. So just as you talk to these third party partners of ours, maybe there's an opportunity to start talking about, you know, that kind of protection in the system, but a relief to our men and women. Because I, I know that they're just, you know, they're constantly getting hammered. And then finally, um, what are some of your thoughts on the APOT future? If you went to this conference, uh, I think for the benefit of the public, what are some of the things that you see happening with our agencies in the region that accept our patients? What, what is something that you could address just briefly about where you see APOT going in the next year? That's a loaded question. It is, <laughs> and it was intentional. Um, before I answer that, I'd like to address one thing you said about the recovery of, okay. of, of our providers real quick. It's a great point and valid, and though there's plenty of work to do on that, um, the one number I didn't share is though the patient stays with AMR after consolidation on average an hour and 20 minutes, our crews on average, they are getting another call, of course, yes. and it's before the hour and 20 minutes, and uh, don't quote me exactly, but it was right in that 45 to 50 minute range before that next call on average. Um, that doesn't solve it, but I think it, it does show an opportunity for a little bit of rest and recovery. Okay. Uh, to your question about APOD, where it's going, I think there's, there's a lot of people in this room who've dealt with this topic for a long time, and I consider myself a rookie at it at this point still. Okay. However, I've been privileged to have the view and participate in some panels, and I'm optimistic. Um, I think our men and women want action and we want change, and and it's very challenging when we don't control all of the process. We don't control the throughput. We don't control the hospital decisions. There's been an increased effort just in my short time in this position of taking aggressive action and educating both the public and the hospitals and working collaboratively. Uh, our Assembly Bill 40, which we all know was passed, that goes into effect at the end of the year. We work closely with Dr. Can, our county medical director on how we navigate and we, we ramp up towards the end of the year. Um, I, I have confidence that he's actively working with the hospitals and we as the, as the providers, uh, myself and I'll speak for Chief House and our, our operations team, we collaborate with him regularly. Um, I have a lot of confidence in the efforts that he's doing. Again, I don't think one person's gonna be able to do it. I think it's gonna take the efforts of likely, uh, you know, directors such as you, County Board of Supervisors, the hospitals, um, but what, I'm, what I am optimistic about and proud of is though we will never control the hospital side of it, um, there's a lot more awareness of it from their side. An example of that is after I presented at the APOD Summit, I had three or four phone calls from hospital uh, executives and our managers reaching out to talk about not just APOD, the consolidation of what we're doing. Those conversations consisted of ideas and them asking about what we think, what we can do. Of course, to help solve our problem, a lot of it does center around their support of our efforts, such as consolidation, right. but also for us to offer those solutions to them. And I've felt it in the last six months that there's much more receptive to that idea and those thoughts. Uh, again, we want action, and I understand that. From what we control, 
there's two major elements that we control in the fire service that we share with our men and women and we also educate the hospitals on. One is a protocol that Dr. Can supports and put in place. Um, and that's, it's referenced as the 50-50 of the destination. And this allows us to selectively work with patients and get them to the right location, one. And two, to assist them to the waiting room when appropriate. And as you can imagine, there's many checks and balances of what's appropriate or not. But this is a decision that we make as paramedics. It's not the hospital's decision. And so when I say we have control, that is one that we control. And so the education piece of that for both the, the nurses who are dealing with it on their end, right, they have a lot to manage, and we have a lot to manage, and that collaboration, the education is important, so they understand our, our decision and why, and we can take action. And, and that step of being able to offload a patient appropriately into a waiting room, which frees us from the hospital, is one of those positive actions we can do. Consolidation is another. Um, as far as the whole APOD thing being solved, I'm, I'm uncertain, to be honest with you. Uh, a lot of it is controlled by what hospitals do. Unfortunately, in our region, we had a, another blow to us this week related to some hospitals and, and construction and things like that, and it's impacting their beds and how many beds they have. And so there's, there's plenty of barriers that keep coming up. Uh, but what I can assure you is we will be creative and we will be aggressive and we will make sure that our men and women are taken care of and they can have as much time to recover, but also we're available for that next patient. Excellent. Yeah, um, an excellent response. Absolutely what I would expect from you. So I appreciate that frankness. Uh, this has been an issue in its different iterations for the better part of half a century, it seems like, in Sacramento County. And so this is not something new. It's just called something different today. But I'm glad you and our partners in the community are on top of it because it's, it's having a significant impact, I think, on our men and women who are, you know, just exhausted from the call volume that we try to manage on a day-to-day -day basis. And I, I'm most not... not to, to, to disparage anyone, but I'm mostly concerned about them and less concerned about hospital executives, okay? So thank you very much for that. Any other questions? I, I'm assuming my colleague would have one. Great point. I, I think that it's fantastic that you guys have the ability to um, make an educated decision on when a patient is appropriate for the emergency department, and I think it will also help the community understand that just because you call 911 does not mean you get to go to the hospital and cut in front of the line. You know, you're 18 with back pain, there's nothing chronic about you, kind of a thing. And so I really love that. And I know that I had the opportunity to join one of the meetings with Dr. Khan, and that was one of my things is, you know, what are we gonna do to, to educate our public? Because while the hospitals do the best that they can, they can do better, always, um, they're, they're also burdened with you know, they, they can't not treat, right? And, uh, but if we change that mentality of some of our community members who abuse that 911 system and the emergency department as their primary care, I think that it will help the situation. So I appreciate it, that's all. I've yeah, and that comes from an expert, so that's got a lot of weight to it. Thank you very much, and Chief, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. And thank you to our AMR partner. I don't see, oh, okay. Thank you for being here this evening. Let's move on to our favorite action items of the year, mid-year budget resolutions. And for efficiency's sake, I think we've had experience in the past where the same two individuals take the leadership of first and second, and we can move through all of these relatively quickly because there's a lot of them, and we're not going to go into each detail, are we? Uh, I, well, I do have a presentation before we vote. Okay, but very when good. When we get to that vote, no, we can just okay, vote very one good. by one. I know we have to approve these individually if past practice uh, remains the same. So with that, um, let's, let's move sure. forward. Great. All right. Uh, good evening, Mr. Chair, directors, Fire Chief House, colleagues, members of the public. I will be presenting the fiscal year 23-24 mid-year budget, which of course is based on actual revenues and expenditures through December, plus forecasting it through the end of the fiscal year. So an agenda of what we're gonna be looking at tonight, kind of logically we'll do an overview of the mid-year budget, big picture numbers, then we'll look at revenues. We'll look at, a, uh, a, we'll look at the IGT transfers, that's your voluntary rate range program and your public provider ground emergency medical transport program um, and, and how, they, how those transfers into the, uh, into the general fund work and what those amounts are these days. And we'll look at general fund expenditures, 
capital outlay, and then have your questions and uh, recommendations for the, the uh, agenda items. So this next slide is the big picture answer to the question of how big is Metro Fire's budget now and what is our reserve? So the middle column there is, is we'll start with that as a general fund. So our revenues anticipated through June 30th are 272.2 million, our expenditures 287.2, and then with net transfers in about 15.6, leaves us with a change in fund balances and an increase in fund balance uh, relative to how we started the year of 565,000 approximately. Um, it's important to note just about the general fund balances, the change in general fund balance, the increase in, um, just for some perspective, the increase in, um, uh, in uh, uh, revenues was approximately 0.3% and the increase in expenditures was 0.6%. So we're talking about very modest changes relative to the final budget you passed in September. Um, but the, so then turning to all funds, you see their revenues 316, almost 317 million, expenditures of 356.8, and that transfers in the 15.6, which leaves uh, an, a change in fund balance, um, reduction in fund balance of 24.3. Now, of course, that is not, that doesn't mean that any fund balance is negative. That just means we're taking more out of those fund balances and reducing the, the total balances. And that will be clearer on the next slide. So before we go there, I just want to note at the bottom there, your projected general fund reserve at the end of the fiscal year is 39.2 million or 13.4%. Okay, so for this slide, this kind of, um, this mashes a, a couple of important uh, tables together from the mid-year budget, the, uh, the, the budget summary all funds table and the fund budget summary table, and I, I put them together because I think it provides a pretty complete picture in one slide of, of where we are. So this is, again, this is all funds, as the title says there, and then across the top are seven funds, and at the right are the, are the totals for each of those funds, and at the, all the way to the left, you have revenues, expenditures, transfers, change in fund balance, and then the ending fund balance. So from a personal finance perspective, I'd like to set it up this way, describe it this way, where those shaded rows are your savings account and those unshaded rows are your checking account. So you have your long-term savings uh, in those shaded rows and then you go in through the year, you're paying your monthly mortgage bill, buying groceries, whatever the case may be. That's what's happening on an annual basis. That's how those funds are changing during the year. So specifically, and these numbers will look familiar from the prior slide, but let's look at general fund. Again, we started with 38.6 million. We got those revenues of 272 million, expenditures of 287. Again, we had, uh, we had transferred in 15.6, so we had a change in fund balance of 565,000. Look at the number right below that in the general fund column, it's 39.2. So that 38.6 at the top was increased by 565,000, gets it to 39.2. I won't go through every single fund that way, but I wanted to just clarify that's how to read this. Capital Facilities Fund, we are at 10.7. Uh, we, um, series of expenditures and revenues, the change in fund balance. We're spending most of the balance there. We end up with a balance of 850,000, and that's typical for any fiscal year. We do, we kind of load up the Capital Facilities Fund at the beginning of the year, we spend it down on projects, we end up with a balance uh, at the end of the year. Uh, lease Properties Fund, we grew that by a bit over the year. It started at 964000 We have rental revenues coming in, increases the amount. It's at 1.5 by the end. Grants Fund, we anticipate spending it all. We wouldn't want to carry over funds uh, in the Grants Fund. Uh, Development Impact Fees Fund started at 6.5. The Over the course of the year, we're spending... Uh, uh, we're, we're spending more that's in there, mostly related to capital projects, which we cover on a later slide. So that gets re that balance in that fund gets reduced at 3.2. Uh, IGT fund, we expect to spend all of it. We'll spend more time on that in a later slide. Special projects fund, similarly, there's 13 million in there. We expect, and, and you expect, we're gonna, we wanna move on that Zinfandel project. So we're, we're anticipating at this point spending it all. So that's, that's kind of, that is where we are with, with those major funds. Okay, so next slide, I'll de delve into general fund revenues. Uh, so property taxes, 202.9 million shown there. It's a modest increase relative to the final, just 490,000. We do update it and got a, a small bump there. Charges for services, 62.6 million, went up by 540,000. And that's mostly uh, in the EMS fees, and the, the bullet below, about $500,000 increase there. We just update it based on what we're seeing every month. Uh, net transfers in were 15.6 million, which is a $4.5 million increase, or excuse me, decrease. Um, and that's related to the IGT element, I'll, I'll go into in a moment. Uh, total general fund revenues and transfers uh, were 287.8 million, which is uh, $3.5 million less than the final budget, mainly related to that IGT piece. 
Okay. So let's talk about IGT for a moment. So there are the two programs, the VRP and the PPG EMT. Started with the VRP at the top there, as noted on the slide. This is we've received funds for the transfer of uh, 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 medical transport services for the uninsured and medical certain medical beneficiaries. We budgeted in the final. We thought we'd get nine million with some updates and some uh, with the updates that we get from our providers. Uh, we think it's actually going to be about seven hundred thousand less than we had in the final. So we had nine point seven in final in net, and now the net is is nine million. On the PPGMT. Let's see, uh, which also is a flat payment per Medi-Cal transport. The numbers again, we expect on uh, most transports we get 1,065, which is an increase of 947 over what we're getting under the prior rate. And or, or on dual benefit patients, we get $778, which was $650 more than we got, got under the prior reimbursement scheme. And so our, our, our mid-year estimate of income is 14 million. Um, so that, what that is is a reduction of about five and a half million from what we had in the final. So that five and a half million is made up of both deferrals and money we don't think we're going to get. So let me start with the deferrals. The deferrals is about three million of that 2.5 million that we just don't think we're going to receive this fiscal year. It is owed. The services have been rendered. We're still dealing with the same issue of um, uh, of the the plans being behind on, on paying paying for the transports that have already occurred. It is, those numbers are ticking up every month. There's more going up. Every, remember, the program goes all the way back to January of 2023. We're still getting payments in for January 2023. And so that that process is ongoing. It does need to catch up, but we anticipate that, that about three million we will of that we will, that is owed, we will get after the end of this fiscal year. Yes. Mr. Tool, if you're comfortable, can I ask you a question about this slide mm -hmm. before I forget? attention span of a gnat. So if you'd just let me ask this question. Um, it looks like in the PPG EMT program, you're saying that we get a flat rate of uh, 1065. For most transfers, there's the, there's two pieces. Okay, yeah. but in that regard, is that 1065 based off of a current rate that we set as a organization? Because I know that in the past we've set our oh. ambulance transport fees and they're on some kind of a rotation. This is, this is, a, this is a federal program that the, the rate is set. They don't care what our go-to exactly. rate is. All right, exactly. thank you, carry on. Exactly. So or I just mentioned not. that there were deferrals and then also there's a reduction. We think that we're actually gonna get, ultimately we will get about two million less than expected. And that is, uh, you were, I thought you were leading me towards it. Um, so the, the dual benefit rate, it says you get 778 versus 1,065. Um, in our estimates, and once we receive with our consultant, uh, they estimated a higher number of the once 1,065 than uh, than 778. And the actuals are coming in. Well, there's more of these what we call Medi Medi 778 dollar uh, transports than that. So we expect to that that's getting reduced. Okay, go ahead. Just real quick, and I might have misheard you. I thought you, I thought I heard you say with our consultant. Who is that? That's that's Whitman, our, okay. our biller. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Sure. Okay, so I will move off uh, revenues uh, to expenditures in the general fund. Let's see. As noted there, uh, the general fund expenditures two hundred eighty-seven point two million again. That's a six point six percent increase. Uh, the labor budget, which includes compensation, benefits, medical, all the labor pieces, uh, is two hundred forty-two point four million, which is about two million or 08 percent higher than final budget. The uh, labor costs will be eighty-four point two percent of general fund revenues, and that transfers in it was eighty-two point five in the final budget. So that did tick up some. Uh, service and supplies will be 41.4 million. That's actually 1.1 million less than what we had in the final. So for the first time in seven years, we actually saw our service and supplies budget reduced from one budget to the next. Uh, that is significant. And um, I do, I do want to credit there. We did have a change in process uh, that the fire chief initiated where we uh, we did in-depth budget reviews with all the divisions, all the division managers to go through their budget. And that did yield, uh, that helped yield this savings. So. You want to say that again, just for the record? <laughs> sure. What did you just say? Sure. The uh, we had a series of budget meetings with the division chiefs uh, that the fire chief initiated, and uh, we ended up saving about one million. So, efficiencies. Yes. Okay, that was loud enough, and thanks for the repeat, because that's a critical part of this puzzle, right? Is in an inflationary environment to have this report showing that we've saved 
over a million dollars is quite spectacular in the sense of the environment doesn't create the savings. The leadership of all these folks out here tonight is pretty impressive, and I think it's important that the community hear that. Thanks. I'm sorry for the interruptions. No problem. So drilling down to uh, the major component of the expenditure side of the general fund budget is labor. So just some, some details I wanted to draw your attention to. Uh, so on the, there's two parts to the labor budget. There's compensation benefits. Compensation is things like your, your wages, uh, it's incentives, it's, um, uh, let's see, out of class pay, sick leave, buybacks, that, all those pieces. It's 134.1 million we anticipate by the end of the fiscal year, which is a 0.1% lower than we had in final. Uh, but there were some significant changes going underneath that number. Even though it was a small change overall, there were some significant things happening underneath. So wages were $5.4 million lower. You recall we budget all our positions as full when we start the year, and then by this point mid-year, we're recognizing that there's gonna be savings by, by the end of the year. Constant staffing, uh, again, higher than what we had in the final budget by about 5.8 million. Uh, incentive pays were a little lower, about 400,000 altogether. On the benefit side, we had 108 million, and um, uh, yeah, as shown there, it's 2.1 percent higher than final. Uh, wanted to mention that there's a set aside in the budget of 1 million to initiate a Section 115 trust, and what that is is we have we you have uh, back in 2012 you set up the uh, California Employer Benefit Retirement Trust for OPEB, other post-employment benefit health obligations. And uh, just to give you a sense, this was presented to the, the committee last month, is we've invested $57 million in it over those 11 years, and uh, the balance is $80 million. So we would like you to consider um, doing something similar with the pension obligation. So uh, this, if you approve this tonight, the money will be set aside, but then I would be coming back with, uh, with um, a selected vendor, that could be PERS, for example, to present to you, this, this is how the program works. Do you want to use that million dollars and set up a, uh, a, a, a pension type uh, Section 115 trust? So uh, we also had total benefit under benefits. We decreased employee medical costs of 1.3 million, so the plans gave us a break there. Uh, and on the upside, or going the other direction, workers' compensation is up by 2.7 million relative to what we had in the final budget. Uh, digging down on, uh, moving from labor to service and supplies, just a few notable numbers there. The natural gas expense went down by 202,000. We had inventory com com computer equipment went down by 88,000. Uh, we had about s almost 700,000 computer services that uh, shifted from, uh, from service and supplies to a license cost. And we had an increase of almost 100,000 for building services, mainly related to sort of the windstorm damage, and we had increased cost to repair uh, facilities that way. So structural budget pressures, just wanted to mention a few, and I, I just mentioned them a moment ago, but this is more of a historical perspective for the first two. So for constant staffing, start there. This is a five-year look plus the 23-24 projection. Uh, you can see in 15, uh, excuse me, in 2018-19, it was about 15.6 million in the final budget. We've been bumping it up last year. It was the highest ever. We got it up to just over 21 million. But still short of actual costs, uh, um, you can see that we're uh, 20, we anticipate being about 27% over budget uh, with, with uh, in the uh, in the mid-year budget as we're proposing today, which is prior years we were 30% over and almost 43% over. So getting getting closer. Um, so that's kind of a trend, a, a significant trend that we see we've seen the last several years. You can kind of follow it there. Workers' compensation is the same years of display, so five years of actual and plus the budget. And uh, want to note in the final budget line there, we had been budgeting you know, 2.4 for most of those years. When we did the final, we recognized this is not this number's not going down on its own. Let's bump it up to 3.6 million, so about a 50% increase. Still think we're going to be short there a little bit, so this budget does include um, uh, you know, transfers to make up the to, to close that gap of about 2.7 million. 
So those are two structural pressures that are addressed in this mid-year budget. That last one, that pension plan funding, that's actually a, a cost for 24, 25, but it is significant, so I put it on here as a pressure. Uh, which is basically, which is, is that the pension costs will increase will increase by 5.5 million next year, 54.3 to 59.8, and uh, mainly due to those investment losses that PERS encountered in um, and reported in June on June 30th of 2022. So we pay for that two years later, and uh, and and because of those investment losses, our funded level we expect to dip to about 62 percent. Um, which is close to where uh, close to where CalPERS starts to request. I'm not going to say demand, but request additional contributions. So we're we're getting to that, getting close to that level. It is an argument for setting up a Section 115 trust. If you have money set aside, when these things happen, you can pull it out and help close those those gaps. So, so those are just, those are structural budget pressures I wanted to mention that before moving on. So <clears throat> capital outlay summary. This is uh, just some highlights from, from the capital outlay page. So our total spending from the capital for capital outlay is 44.8 million there, and 18.4 million of that committed from the, uh, from the capital facilities fund. I, I list some projects there from major capital outlay projects that are funded from the capital facilities fund, which includes five type one engines, six ambulances, six ambulance remounts, and gurneys and power loaders. Uh, we also had some major capital outlay projects funded with other funds. Um, there's a development impact fee fund uh, mentioned before, so Grantline 220 would expect to con commit 2.4 million to that, Vineyard Springs 10.4, and then of course there's Infantil Training Center uh, 13 million uh, altogether, 13.6 million altogether for that. So uh, this is your summary of what was presented tonight. So the district's budget is balanced. Uh, we expect to add 565000 to the general fund reserve. The amounts of change were pretty small. We saw, again, mid-year from final to mid-year. General fund revenue went up 0.3%, expenditures by 0.6%. Uh, the mid-year budget revises the, the general fund reserve from 14% in the final to 13.4%, reflecting that the expenditures were more than the amount of increase in the reserve. Uh, IGT transfers decreased or deferred, lowered the net transfer amount to the general fund by 6.2 million altogether. And then we have these structural budget pressures I just mentioned that persist. So about 8.5 million if you count the workers' comp and the constant staffing together. And then we have that additional 5.5 we'll, we'll need to address next year. So my recommendation is to approve the resolutions adopting the mid-year budget. And I welcome any questions. All right, thank you, Mr. O'Toole. Members of the board, questions for the CFO? You're off the hook for questions. <laughs> thank you very much for that presentation. We'll start with the adoption of resolutions as an action item. We'll start with A, resolution 2023-24 mid-year budget for the General Operating Fund 212A. Can I entertain a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Thank you. Motion passes. <laughs> <laughs> Probably want to wait till at least he votes. <laughs> Sorry. All right, here we go. Yeah. Item B, resolution 2023 mid-year budget for the Capital Facility Fund, 212. D is in David. I entertain a motion. So moved. Second? Second. Madam Clerk, call the roll, please. Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Thank you. Excellent. Item C, resolution 2023-24, mid-year budget for the pension obligation bond fund, 212E as in Edward. Entertain a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Please call the roll. Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Thank you. Item D, resolution 2023-24, mid-year budget for the grants fund, 212G is in George. Entertain a motion. So moved. Second. Second. Madam Director Clark. Weber. Aye. Director Sheets. Aye. President Gould. Aye. Director Wood. Aye. Director Rice. Aye. Director Clark. Aye. Thank you. Item E, resolution 2023-24, mid-year budget for the development impact fee funds, 212I. Motion. So moved. Second. Second. 
Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item F, Resolution 2023-24, Mid-Year Budget for the Leased Properties Fund, 212L. Motion? So moved. Second? Second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Thank you. Thank you. Item G, Resolution 2023-24, Mid-Year Budget for the IGT Fund, 212M. Motion? So moved. Second. Second. Madam Clerk? Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Thank you. And the final one, item H, Resolution 2023 Mid-Year Budget for the Special Projects Fund, 212. S is in Sam. Motion? So moved. Second? Second. Madam Clerk? Director Weber? Aye. Director Sheets? Aye. President Gould? Aye. Director Wood? Aye. Director Rice? Aye. Director Clark? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes. The budget is adopted. All your resolutions. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Let's move on to reports. I have no report from the president's uh, seat. We'll move on to the fire chief's report. Good evening. I have no report. Thank you. We'll move on to operations report. It says Chief Mitchell, but I have it on good authority that he doesn't want to stand up and come to the podium. So we're going to have uh, Chief Johnson come up and introduce us to a wonderful crew that provides services to our community. Thank you, President Gold, directors, fire chief house, brothers and sisters, Metro Fire, Mike Johnson, assistant chief, in charge of the C-shift as a shift commander. Um, I have the honor of uh, bringing Rescue 21 on the C-shift up here as part of the shift commander spotlight. Um, I know that company, come on up, guys. I know that company is near and dear to at least two of the board members. Um, I think all of us are near and dear. <laughs> yeah, especially the two of them. At yeah. least two. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but the reason for this spotlight is based on a recent incident we had. Um, due to the nature of the incident, um, the fine details are not probably appropriate for the public setting. But really what I wanted to highlight is the professionalism of these gentlemen. Um, as you know, the disciplines that they're responsible for on the rescue, it, it's mind-boggling to me. And to know that they can be just consummate professionals at all of those disciplines and always carry themselves in a way that is admirable is uh, enough to recognize them on its face. Um, but this one was an interesting one and something I'm very proud of these men for. Um, the request came in from a hospital. Um, they had a patient and they were basically out of options for this gentleman and their final option was not a good one for this gentleman. So they uh, reached out to an ambulance crew that was on scene. I had a, offloaded a patient probably on the wall, I don't know. Um, but they um, asked him if they could help. And so they went and looked, and they knew that they, this was beyond their scope, but they were willing to throw these guys under the bus, and so got them <laughs> requested there. So uh, they got there, formed an assessment of what was going on, um, tried some less than evasive maneuvers uh, without success, and this started the ball rolling. Where their hearts were is that they really wanted to do something for this gentleman. Um, the hospital was gracious to say, well, you guys be creative. Like we'll, uh, we'll support whatever it is you want. Um, what I know about these guys is I've seen them break a lot of things and do a lot of destructive work. This was not a situation that would call for that. This needed to be very surgical and precise. Um, so the, the ball got rolling. And the level of support that I had um, from the phone call from them, um, from the deputy chief level to the <coughs> EMS division level to uh, the MIH, um, which included uh, the LEMSA. Everybody was on board with what we were about to do. And um, to the fact where I was met by BC Perryman at the hospital pretty much at the same time, um, really we came there as, as, as a show of support to these gentlemen. They were put into a position that um, none of us had probably been in, but I wanted them to know that the agency had their back. And we put a bunch of checks in place that they felt that before the, um, they, they literally scrubbed in and went surgical on this procedure. Um, the procedure was well thought out. 
They were confident in what they were going to achieve. They achieved it in a very short amount of time, and I would venture to guess that the patient today is very happy with the outcome. So without further ado, I would like to introduce these fine gentlemen. I will tell you that they exemplify on a daily basis the core values of this agency, but it showed in that hospital room. And um, not only was it a sense of relief and achievement for them, but the gratitude from the hospital staff was absolutely incredible. And Metro Fire showed extremely well once again on that day. So I will let uh, Captain J.D. Flint introduce his crew. And uh, you guys can pepper him with uh, tough rescue questions. <laughs> Wow. Thank you guys for having us. Uh, we're happy to be here. I'm Captain J.D. Flint. Rest if you'd step up to the mic, Captain, please, so Sorry. that we can get you on NBC. Yeah, Go right. Ahead. Uh, Captain J.D. Flint, Rescue 21 Sea Shift. This is uh, Engineer Casey Carlisle, uh, Firefighter Adam Rosen, and Firefighter Ryan Smith. So um, to kind of shadow what Chief Johnson said, we were tasked um, with a very unique call. Um, I'd be more than happy to go into details if you guys want to hear, but that's up to you guys. Um, but I will say from my perspective, um, the level of support that we got was greatly appreciated. Um, ultimately, after talking with Chief and the support we had, they left it in our hands. They said, if you want to help this gentleman and you guys feel like you can do it, it's for you guys to make that decision. If you think it's not for you or you don't want to take that risk, we support that too. Um, with this, we, with these gentlemen that we get to train with all the time, I knew we had the tools, I knew we had the capabilities, and I knew we had the ability. Um, at the end of the day, it's one of those things we could walk away from knowing that it wasn't really in our wheelhouse, but I also knew we had the opportunity to help somebody. Um, so that came with its challenges that this isn't our patient, this isn't our call, this isn't an emergency setting. We're now inside of a trauma room. We're legitimately almost scrubbed in. We have face protection on, we have the bright lights, we have doctors on standby, we have people on the phone. This turned into a very big ordeal and it happened for the most part very quickly. So to see Chief Johnson, Chief Perryman there, and then I know there was a bunch of other people supporting us um, all the way up to the medical, medical director, Mind you, this was on a Sunday afternoon. So uh, for people to answer their phones and to step up for us, that gave me a ton of um, relief and support. So we um, had a crew meeting, said everybody good with this. We did a, you know, basically uh, everyone raise their hand if you're good. And if anybody says no, we're out. Um, everybody was in on it. And Chief Johnson was right there with us. Uh, Chief Perryman was there um, pro providing some very critical anatomy um, details for us that we probably should have known for this call and uh like i said with without a hitch this thing went off and from start to finish the whole ordeal what a couple hours but the, from start to finish our procedure 16 minutes and this guy's probably very happy that we were there to help um, so i know it's a big sense of relief and for us and for the agency we serve the high trust state that was put in us but then also the support that we had knowing that that um, the kind of support we have should we need to do this again for anything for that matter was very beneficial so we, we thank everybody, everybody for the support, because without that, it doesn't put a lot of trust and confidence in us if we don't have that support. And I know Chief Rice probably been there. You got to make some decisions, and sometimes you got to make a decision right now. And I would have made that decision, but knowing that we had that, the backing was uh, much more helpful. So, Excellent. Thank you very much for that. Let's go to our two directors that have a special relationships, and then the rest of us will chime in. <laughs> thank you very much. I'm not going to ask about figure eights and that sort of thing, but <laughs> I've got a pretty good idea what you were dealing with. Um, thank you very much for stepping up and way beyond what was probably a very uh, unique and uncomfortable situation for you, but thank you for doing what you did. Thank you. Absolutely. Director Rice. Just real quick, you guys. Um, same as I thought about it with Bob, it's obviously some kind of an impaling or something, but there's nobody left to call. And, and that is what Rick Martinez, the fire chief, what Anthony Castros, Mike Daw, Forrest Rao, the people that were really kind of the ground floor of forcing this to happen, which we all thought they were nuts. There's no way you're going to get a rescue company at this department. That is exactly what the founders of that idea and everybody else that has worked there in between time, that's what we all had in mind. And I just appreciate it. it. makes me proud to be an alum from Rescue 21. Nice job. I don't even know what you did, but I know it was a nice job. Thank you. Thanks. Other members of the board, unrelated to Station 21, and have no feelings about these gentlemen. <laughs> Can't articulate it better. Couple of times that we had to call the fire department, and just knowing that you guys stepped up, um, because it probably took a lot of <clears throat> relief off of the hospital staff. Um, you know, they. 
we, we get as creative as we can and we just don't have sometimes the tools that you guys have um, when there is a delicate situation or whatnot. And so um, I know that you know you guys doing what was right, not only for the member, but also to support our hospital partners, um, that does build and keeps building those relationships that hopefully when you guys do show up, you guys aren't on the wall because they're, you know, looking at your best interest and trying to get you guys back out to the community to serve. So right. appreciate that. Yep. Yeah, and I just want to say I, I, I totally agree with what Director Rice said is who else, if you guys didn't, there's nobody else. Yeah, and so it's really fascinating to me that in a facility that is so high tech, saves lives on a daily basis, has every piece of equipment you could ever imagine to take care of human beings, at the end of the day, they call 911 and get the fire department to show up. That's just fascinating and certainly a story worth all sorts of tabloid stuff because it's just so unique that the hospital stands around and goes, what do we do now? Well, I guess we call 911. What? You are 911, right? So that's kind of an interesting dynamic. Good for all of you, and thank you, Captain, for recognizing the support that you receive from the executive team as well, and all those different players. Uh, I, I think that really does exemplify the men and women of this organization and, and the support that you all can count on. I know this was unique, but I don't think it's unique. I think it would happen if it was necessary more frequently. So that's kudos to everyone in the organization. What a great story. Uh, thank you very much for being here tonight with your crew as well. Uh, uh, Chief, is there anything else that we need to do with this wonderful group? Do you have any kind of medical procedure that you don't want to seek a doctor for? Oh, God. <laughs> Smith has a steady hand. <laughs> okay. That is it. I'm not sure what that means, but we'll go with it. Thank you. Bob's got That's a awesome. Rash. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Um, I also believe that, uh, Chief Bailey, do we have an administrator or administrative report? No administrative or support services as well as a communication center JPA report this evening. Okay, thank you very much for that. Let's move on to local firefighters, local 522 report. Uh, good evening, President Gould, board members, Chief House, and members of the public. Uh, in an effort to get you into a lengthy closed session. We'll yeah, keep it short you. and sweet. Um, just want to pass along that uh, we're still moving forward with a lot of this health and wellness uh, project that we've been working on. Uh, even today, 522 along with management met with the Cancer Support Network and we're looking forward to coordinating with them uh, here in the very near future on some trainings and possibly some future uh, screenings to come um, and have some coordination with them here in the near future. Also, the reason Sean's not here tonight, he wanted me to pass along to all of you. He was sadly couldn't make it because he's having a baby and making an addition to his family. So his congratulations to Sean. Baby. His <laughs> wife is having the baby Give him credit. He doesn't do So he, he just wanted me to pass that along to you. Okay. So with that, I'm contained. Uh, congratulations to his wife and him uh, can, uh, can you, for, uh, tonight. You forgot to mention your name. Oh, my apologies. Pete Votava, Local 522 Director. All right. Thank there you. you Thanks, Pete. Appreciate that. Moving along to our, uh, let's see, we have committee and delegate reports. I have no report from the executive committee. We have not met. Uh, next meeting to be determined. Uh, comm Center, and we're not going to have a Comm Center report. Let's go with Finance and Audit Committee, Director Jones, who is not with us tonight. I don't believe there's anyone to report out for that group, correct? Oh. All right, and then there is a, a little bit of a change in the policy committee report out. The policy committee tonight was canceled. Uh, we struggled to get uh, all of our players in, in the same room tonight. But the next meeting will be is scheduled for April 11, 2024, 5 uh, 5.30 in these chambers. So with that, let's, uh, let's move on to board member questions and comments. We'll start with Director Weber, if we could. I just have something real quick here because I was silenced last week or last meeting. Uh, along with recognition that, that happens, um, this has been brought to my attention last year, year and three months. I would like to recognize the board um, because we're privy to what I found out, a lot of uh, information that you're not used to. Some of the information takes us out at the knees. Some of it makes us sick. Some of it breaks our hearts and some just 
flat makes us mad. And so these individuals, they carry the, the same amount of love and compassion that you care for, but nobody ever really thinks about thanking them for all of this baggage that they take home with them as well. So I'd just like to thank them from the bottom of my heart. Um, it, uh, it's not easy to carry around this stuff, especially for you that have been doing this all of your adult life. Um, I, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. That's it. I think you just assumed we're adults. I know. <laughs> thank you, Bob. That's very kind of you to, to bring up. Uh, Director Rice? Um, just one quick thing. Um, I was on a family business over the weekend, and um, about 35 members of Metro Fire um, participated in the Leukemia Lymphoma Society stair climb in Seattle. Um, I was fortunate enough to break away from my three-year-old grandson's birthday and got to at le least touch base. Um, Ryan Ross, um, Captain Kurt Kachiyoshi, and, and I think Kurt kind of really um, spearheaded it, I think, but... Um, what Metro, Metro Fire was really well represented, and uh, they all did that of their own accord, and I do believe it was a fundraiser. So I hope we keep it on our, on our I'm, I plan to keep it on my calendar. So it was a great event. So congratulations and super proud of the Metro Fire. I'm proud of all of you, but the members that went up to do the stair climb, fantastic. Full gear and on air. And they most of them did it in around 20 minutes, right in there, give or take. So that's awesome. Anything that's all else? contained. Thank you. Director Clark. Yes. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, I just want to do a real quickly uh, thank um, Captain uh, Daniel Hoy Oy, for his invitation to it, uh, his uh, presentation at the uh, Academy on, um, was it, I think it was on Wednesday. And regarding uh, hazardous materials, and I think it was a very good presentation. I really enjoyed it. So uh, uh, thank you for that invitation. So. Thank you, Director. Mm -hmm. Director Sheets? No problem. Director Wood? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got two things. I just want to uh, say uh, congratulations to Chief Perryman for his recognition for all of his work that he's done in MIH. Appreciate you bringing that to our attention, Chief. And uh, I want to thank everyone who had their hand in making the service for Firefighter Ben Alicia as beautiful as it was. So thank you. Yes, thank you, Director Wood. Um, I too want to echo those sentiments. The, the celebration of life that we participated in on Saturday was unbelievably professional, well done, and heartfelt. And it was nice to see all of the members of our Metro family that could make it be there. And as someone who's received a bit of that in my past, I can tell you it has a massive influence on the family, long term. Thank you very much. Appreciate y'all being here. Now go away, because we do not want to see you when we come back out of closed session. Recording stopped. <laughs>